Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Utkarsh. I'm so happy to be welcoming my friend Manu back to Network Capital. He's written a phenomenal book called False Allies, a book that I've enjoyed reading so much over the past few weeks. And today I'm going to uh, take off from where we left our conversation the last time and uh, discuss more about his book, his career, and uh, essentially his point of view on something which I find fascinating. So Manu, welcome back to Network Capital. How are you? Thank you, Utkash. Pleasure to be back. Um, as well as one can be in the middle of a pandemic, you know, with no complaints, haven't been infected so far. So, you know, I have, I have no reason to complain. Uh, new book is out. So, you know, that's even happy news in the middle of a rather weird time. So in general, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. All right. Awesome. Why is the book called False Allies? Well, you know, the, the subject of the book is the Indian princely states. And, you know, we often, when we think of modern Indian history, what we don't realize is that we're thinking about British ruled India, which was about 60% of the Indian subcontinent, whereas 40% of the Indian subcontinent was under Indians who were in treaty relations with the British. So these are the Maharajas, of which about 100 odd were the main Maharajas. And they were often presented as allies of the British Empire, pillars of the Raj, and so on. But as I discovered through my research, this is a rather simplistic reading because resistance to colonialism didn't just happen uh, in British India. It happened even in the princely states. Even the Rajas did not just uh, sit back and accept all kinds of pressures from above. They were able to sort of push back in their own very interesting and creative ways, ranging from the use of language, dress, ritual, uh, even funding organizations like the Congress Party, funding revolutionaries and supporting them uh, behind the scenes, which to me sounded like a very exciting story and, and something that was worth researching and worth studying. So I think, you know, the, the idea behind false allies was that although in theory they're allies of the British, they were not fully committed or fully sincere to that alliance. They were false to it. And similarly, of course, eventually they fall out even with the nationalists, even though at one point uh, for the large, uh, larger stretch of the freedom struggle, the Congress and the nationalists and the Rajas were all pretty friendly with each other. Uh, by the 1930s, they fall out with the Rajas as well, because uh, in a sense, they were, uh, I suppose, false allies of the nationalist struggle as well, because they very much cared about their power their political legitimacy and their political spaces. So I suppose they were ultimately false allies to everybody. Uh, but, you know, that's, mm. that's, that's yeah, you'll, you'll need to read the book. Uh, I mean, your viewers will need to read the book in, in detail to get uh, the nuances of that argument better. Yeah, for sure. Um, this is a subject on which I got questions from our communities around the world, not just uh, in India. So I, as I understand, the book is largely available in India, but I'm going to try and have it sent in other parts of the world as well. I got questions from Australia, uh, from the US, from UK, where it's surprisingly mm -hmm. not available, uh, from France and so forth. Um, everyone asked me, um, what is politics and how did Manu get interested in this particular subject? How did a historian get interested in the politics of the Maharaja, so to speak? So, I mean, to begin with, on the on, on your point about the books not being available, the way publishing works is that you give out your contracts based on geography. So, for instance, in the Indian subcontinent, I've got this publisher. You need to get another publisher, or unless you have some kind of you know common publisher for all uh, geographies. Mm -hmm. But often the case is you have a UK publisher, you have a US publisher, and you have an India publisher. That's generally the way it works. Uh, in this case, I actually have another international deal in the in the pipeline which means that i can't topple that or upset that and bring this one uh, available and make it available abroad till that one is up so it's a bit complicated at the moment so it's only available in india but coming to to, to the politics of it you know you know as a historian the things that interest me are always things that are understudied. You know, we have the usual narratives, we have the usual big picture questions, we've got the usual idea, you know, first there was the ancient period, then the medieval period, then the British period, and the nationalist struggle, you know, that's the way we look at Indian history. But I've always looked for stories that haven't necessarily received their due, and have in some respects or the other been footnoted, been forgotten, been marginalized in some way or the other. And for me, for example, in this case, the fact that 
40% of the country's history, their experience of colonialism. Millions of people lived in these states. How did colonialism operate in this 40% of India that was not under British rule? How did resistance to imperialism take place in this, this particular part of India? Um, you know, it tells us so much about caste politics, communalism, about, you know, identities, about, you know, political personalities and so on, about how, how the structures of power are constructed and how ultimately they can be sustained and how ultimately they, they, they fold up. All of these things can be understood by looking at princely India, because, you know, till the 1930s, people thought the princely states would not go away anywhere. And yet, uh, you know, less than 15 years later, they, they were gone. They were done. You know, they, they, they didn't exist on the map of India after that, which is also a way of looking at how history can sometimes offer us clues, which is that things we take for granted can very quickly go away, can very quickly sort of dissolve from the scene. So these are the kind of questions that interest me. And, you know, from my first book onwards, I've looked for relatively, uh, you know, unknown or relatively marginalized stories. And the princely state seemed like one such subject. Generally, when we think of the Rajas, we think of elephants, dancing girls, palaces, jewelry, but we don't think of them as politicians. Whereas in reality, as I found, many of them were politicians, very astute politicians. Uh, many of them were thinkers. Many of them wrote prolifically. Many of them engaged on, on debates on colonial imperialism and India's future. Uh, the first draft constitution in India was, was made for, in a princely state by a princely minister, not, uh, you know, by in, in British ruled India. And what people don't know is that the nationalists were also deeply, uh, you know, uh, fond of the princely states and very keen that the Rajas should uh, modernize and should be able to move into the future and, and have a place in post-colonial India. That opinion changes very late in the day, but for the longer period, that was the case. And as somebody who's worked in politics, as you know, I used to work for a parliamentarian back in the day many, many years ago. Uh, the, the thing is, this sort of thing interests me. You know, what people often describe as high politics, what people often describe as you know, behind the scenes, corridors of power, diplomacy. These are the kind of issues that attract me in general. And I found that, you know, this book gave me an avenue to explore that from a historical perspective. Fascinating. Now I'm going to ask you something that is very popular these days in the venture capital and tech industry. Uh, but of course, you have to contextualize it to false allies. What's something that you believe in that others often disagree with? Oof, that's an interesting question. I mean, uh, forget history in general. I'm not entirely sold on well, maybe this is too politically incorrect to stay in, say in today's world, but, you know, there's a kind of vocism that is building up. And I understand that, you know, there is a requirement for correction. There is a requirement to acknowledge certain errors, certain structural flaws, etc. But as somebody who studies history, I can look at patterns in the past where sometimes people can have very solid convictions that theirs is the right way to do things and everything else is wrong. And that kind of black and white whiteization of, of the world is something that happened in the colonial period. It's happened before. And in, I can't help but sometimes bring the historical lens to some of the conversations that we have today and the maximalist positions that people take in the name of their values or their principles. Whereas to me, it looks like the world has always been built on con consensus, on compromise, on discussion, and on agreeing to disagree, because you can't always get everything uh, in its ideal form. So I know that this, this is probably a deeply unpopular answer to give, but as somebody who studies history, uh, when, I, when I look at some of the debates happening in the world today, or the attitude that a lot of young kids bring to, to a number of issues, uh, especially on social media and so on, this is something that worries me a little. A lot of people obviously disagree with me because they think, you know, fighting for justice has to be done in, in this very stern, pointed kind of way. But as somebody who's worked in, in, in a political environment where you do have to reach out even to your so-called enemies, competitors, rivals, you have to build uh, a, a kind of working relationship and so on. That kind of uh, that kind of approach is something that's very difficult for me to swallow, uh, and and as somebody who also studies history, it becomes doubly difficult because what I see of the past is also something that is similar, which is that uh, any time people have been convinced that theirs is the only right way, and that everything else must necessarily fold before it, it actually ends up doing more damage uh, than good. So that's that's I think what I would say. Again, I, I perhaps shouldn't have said it, but never mind. Now I've given you an honest answer. No, this question uh, is meant to provoke. This question is actually asked by uh, 
a venture capitalist, a very controversial venture capitalist called Peter Thiel in all his interview mm-hmm. questions, all in the things that he decides to fund because he tries to uh, pick people who are contrarians. So he asked this, I thought I'll ask this question of you because in your book, you are making a contrarian point of view, right? Even if you're Maharaja, uh, do you need to compromise? Tell us more about it. Of course. I mean, they. let's look at it this way. Look at the Rajput states. Rajputanas, as you know, in northern India, you know, these are even now when people think of Indian Maharajas, the image that usually comes in front of your eyes is of a Rajput fort somewhere in the desert and then people in colorful turbans and that kind of thing. And they do actually still have coronation rituals, etc. in the ex-royal families of Rajputana. But you look at how they operated in the colonial period. In the early 19th century, when the British arrived in Rajputana, having defeated the Marathas, who were the previous preeminent power in India, and the, and the final rivals the British had to decimate, uh, they were actually welcomed by the Rajput Rajas, because the Rajputs were chafing under the control of the Marathas. And that had caused so much resentment that they actually welcomed the British as liberators. But the moment the British became the new overlords, naturally the Rajputs began to resent them as well, because the point is ultimately you switch one overlord with a new overlord, your position hasn't necessarily changed, you're still subservient. They found interesting ways. So at one moment you welcome them and you use British support to regain your political influence, to regain political vitality. But having regained political vitality, you also realize that now you need to keep uh, the British, your overlords, at an arm's length. You need to prevent them from becoming what the Marathas were earlier. And that results in some very interesting negotiations. It results in very interesting ways in which politics is conducted. Uh, You know, my favorite example in Rajput courts is about ritual. You know, British officers entering would sometimes say that we must enter with our shoes on. Although, as you might know, in Indian traditional setups, you don't wear your slippers yeah. into formal halls. You don't, you leave it at the door before you go inside, even in ordinary people's houses. So to enter a Raja's Darbar with, his, with your shoes on was naturally something that gave offense to the, to the Indians who were in the Darbar. Now, for the British, it was a simple question. They would wear their shoes because from where they were coming from, in in their culture, taking it off was awkward. Similarly, many of them objected to sitting down on the floor, squatting on the floor on on mattresses and gatis and insisted that they should have chairs. But the thing is, it's not just about shoes and chairs. As I said, if the Raja permitted English people to enter his darbar with their shoes on, it was an affront to his prestige and his dignity. The Raja himself sat on gaddis, which were barely raised above the floor. So to give a chair to the Englishman would very visually mean that the Englishman was in a position that was higher than the Raja. They sometimes fought over issues such as the distance of the Englishman's seat from the throne, because all of that had political meaning, whether the the Englishman was seated on the left side or the right side, because that too had political meaning. The left was less uh, grand than the right side, so the English would insist on sitting on the right, but the Raja would insist on keeping them on the left. Uh, When when, the the English sent the the Raja's titles and, and, and medals and so on, it was very. It was with some hesitation that the Raja sometimes accepted these and wore them because for them it was a reminder of their, let's say, slavery or their or their subordination uh, to the British. The result was there were interesting ways, ways by which some of them negotiated this. They couldn't completely upset the British. All the same, they had to protect their turf. So my favorite example is this man called Ram Singh of Jaipur, who who died in the early 1880s. Mm. Uh, a very fascinating man. He was. He came to power in the 1850s, and he needed British support to get rid of rid of his own regents who were who were controlling the court. So there, he required the British. But having come to power, he discovered that you know, as per his treaty with the with the East India Company, any revenue he generated about 40 lakh rupees, he would have to give the British a cut. So he started fudging his accounts, making sure his revenue was always 39 lakhs, 30. 8 lakhs, etc. So that it never crossed 40 and he never ended up giving the British their due, even when his revenue was actually close to 60 lakhs. He just kept fudging his accounts. And the British knew this, but they also were willing to let it go because the price, or rather the loyalty of the Raja and his, his alliance with the British was more important than chasing money alone. So, you know, on both ends of the spectrum, each player tried to make sure that their position was one of advantage, but there was always a kind of give and take. There was always a kind of 
push and pull between the two. It was not a situation where the Rajas could all sort of band together and say, we will now push the British out of India because realistically they didn't have the authority. So then the question was, how do we maintain the influence we have without further depletion of the hands of the British? Now, the British, on the other hand, they had all the hard power that was needed, but they did not have cultural legitimacy. They required the Rajas to be with them because only by having them by their side did the British look less alien in a country where they were actually aliens, where they were foreigners. So each knew that they had strengths and weaknesses and each played accordingly. But both made sure that, you know, this was a relationship. At times and there was animosity, at cooperation, but ultimately self-interest governed all of this. But there was always a, a great amount of give, give and take uh, in that connection, in that, in that situation. Negotiation of sorts, right? Yes. Even if you're Maharaja or a Britisher, yeah. So I discovered a gentleman called Raja Ravi Varma through um, uh, you know, textbooks at my mom's house. So my grandfather evidently used to have books which would be neatly covered in papers, many of which had uh, paintings by Raja Ravi Varma. And I discovered, of course, when I was a uh, few years in school that, oh, this is a painter, this is uh, what he's done. But reading your book gave me a lot deeper insight into Raja Ravi Varma. How did you discover this person and uh, how does this person become a tool of historical exploration in your uh, uh, fantastic novel or uh, books? He was, rather. He was um, you know, a society painter of the late 19th century. He was born in a princely state, came from the aristocracy, was related to royalty. To begin with, what, what was interesting about him was he was the one of the first Indian gentleman artists of that time. So earlier you have Indian artists, but they were often treated at court and by patrons as artisans, as craftsmen, not as artists as we understand it today. So the, the, your, your individual agency was very limited as somebody, and, and typically many of them came from castes and communities that worked in art as opposed to an aristocrat choosing to do art. So already Ravi Varma was slightly different there. His family background, his networks, his privilege in some ways helped him. Um, but the other thing was that he was also a talented man, of course, but not. it wasn't merely talent. What was interesting is that he was a very hardworking man. He made use of technology. He made use of networks. He sort of really hustled to become the legend that he is today, which is interesting because today, if you go to Kerala, which is where he was born, there's all kinds of, you know, myths around him, these legendary stories about how he was preordained for greatness and how spirits had, had proclaimed and prophesied that as a child that he would grow up and become a famous man and so on. But in reality, you find that, no, it, it was purely the fact that he was not comfortable being just an aristocrat. He was willing to go out there and hustle. That is what made him the man he is today. And what do I mean by hustling? As an aristocrat, his uncles, his, his grandmother's generation, they all painted. But they painted as aristocrats in their country estate as a hobby. That was what they did. He decided to turn that into a profession and to a rather lucrative profession and chase what we now call success, you know, in that very obvious way. Um, so this meant that although he began, he went to the court of his relative, Travancore Maharaja, and painted there for about 18, 19 years. Uh, as soon as he got an opportunity, he received a paid commission from a, a person socially inferior to him, a judge in Malabar, but not his equal in terms of caste and social ranking, but accepted and did that portrait for him. Then in the late 1870s, when he's still uh, a, a young man, he gets a commission from another princely state, goes there and works for money. And the interesting thing is people in his own family look down on him for that. They said, you're an aristocrat, you come from landed wealth, you should not be going and standing like a public in the courts of assorted rajas, because your own ancestors were rajas why should you do that but he said no and he he continued to do that and the ultimate thing is he also pulled you know, poured in a lot of his money pulled together put printing press uh, you just you, you just mentioned that you know there were these these covers that your grandfather wrapped his books in which yeah. had pictures by Ravi Varma it's because he invested his money in a press he was not content painting just for the elites at one point he realized that these images might have mass appeal. And more importantly, in the late 19th century, a lot of Indians had a way to visualize their gods. You saw the god in the temple, and then you looked at ancient and medieval sculptures, but this is not really something you could relate to. Whereas he now started painting gods in Victorian sort of high neck blouses and saris of the modern type, you know, everybody in a, in, a, in a very contemporary style in the late 19th century. And by producing cheap prints of it that were affordable, 
uh, suddenly these gods were accessible to everybody they could they could end up in the houses of lower middle class people where they could worship them it ended up on matchboxes he was regularly plagiarized people copied his work and put it in on, on on tins and and talcum powder boxes and things like that because he was so familiar it was so popular mm. and by doing that he actually energized the process of nationalism in the country at a time when people spoke different languages dressed differently ate differently didn't have a common language the gods became one common visual vocabulary to which they could relate and his press and his entrepreneurship sort of ended up uh, promoting that i use him in the book for this reason which is that he had friends on the nationalist side he had friends on the princely side and because he painted you know multiple rajas i choose the five princely states where he went and worked for the various rajas who ruled them he also ended up helping these rajas project their political personalities so a simple portrait just like today you look at the the official pictures released of prime ministers and presidents around the world they are released with great care because every you know the pictures are meant to communicate something it's not just that oh this the president went here and gave a speech no it's meant to demonstrate leadership it's meant to demonstrate authority it's meant to That's demonstrate right. a certain <clears throat> image of the ruler and it was the same in his time so when he painted a raja the books that were placed in the background the furniture that was placed there uh, what was in the background whether it was an indian scene or not whether the the, the raja was on a tricycle or whether he was standing in a certain posture all of this was also about communicating a political message not just about tracing the likeness of of a random human being it was about the self image that the person wanted to project to the people or to you know uh, to even his adversaries and i think for that reason also ravi verma is interesting because he wasn't just a portraitist he was also somebody who helped people actualize and realize their intended political personalities fascinating and um... talk to us about the five states that you took talk to us um about his networks and the journey and some of his reflections that surprised you people should obviously read the book to get a full picture but maybe some high level insights or takeaways because as an entrepreneur i think his hustle appeals a lot to me and i can see the way he sort of evangelized his product which was art was fascinating in a in an era before you know instagram the internet etc cetera, etc cetera. in fact so i would love to hear more it it's sad that you know he got branded a calendar artist precisely because he uh, produced these cheap prints a lot of people thought that was what he did whereas in reality his works his actual oil paintings are of a, of a higher quality but the prints ended up in some ways cheapening him but if you look at the larger contribution he made you know as about a decade before he made prince it was a, a statesman called sir t madhav rao who was a minister in multiple princely states a man who wrote a great deal on british indian and and princely politics he was the one who told ravi varma that you must produce prince as a service to your country so even 10 years before he started the press ravi varma knew that this wasn't just about art it was about some kind of a larger cause it was about serving a larger purpose with art rather than art for its own sake and people will have philosophical differences with it some people believe art should be for its own sake whereas in his case he very clearly believed art has to serve a larger purpose which in his case was mm-hmm. constructing some kind of national unity some kind of cultural uh, identity for indians as a whole so that was the thing the other thing is that there was risk involved because you know to begin with as i said the very fact that he was painting for money upset his own uh, kin and, and and relatives back home in kerala they, they thought he was demeaning himself a very colorful story i heard has it that uh, after he died some of his unfinished canvases were were torn up and used to cover pickle jars because that was the amount of respect his family members gave his work it's an apocryphal story obviously exaggerated but it's meant to communicate that his own family did not necessarily see his his work as worthwhile at that time even though the rest of the world did and the biggest thing is he lost money in that press the press you know churned out all these images they became wildly popular but he was no businessman and he ended up losing money and 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 he took years to pay off his debts and it almost till his final years he was settling the debts that he had he had incurred because of that press but if you look at the larger contribution he took a risk he did not necessarily profit in a financial sense but in many ways he got enshrined right up there as somebody who who created the gods that we visualize today 
that is what i mean the, the pictures he created in, ended up inspiring theater productions in india it inspired ended up inspiring the first f- films that were made the first moving pictures that were made in india which were all set on on in, in mythological stories and that was the kind of topic they built on even the if you remember from the 1980s i remember when i was growing up in the 90s they still played uh, the ramayana and mahabharat series that came up on tv in those days the costumes the way all of that is de- is designed often comes out of how ravi varma painted them a hundred years before so he did not necessarily his the risk he took did not necessarily pay him in a in a personal sense but it ended up leaving a very large mark on history as i said the very fact that his work was plagiarized to sell everything from matchboxes to baby powder to talcum powder suggests that he did tap into something big and what's also interesting is that i remember uh, seeing correspondence that he had with gokhale and with the british authorities meetings yeah. with the viceroy and so on about getting a copyright law because he realized that his hard work was being uh, was others were benefiting from it and there was nothing that could be done because his copyright wasn't protected so there wasn't a legal infrastructure to protect him either in some ways he was one or two decades ahead of his time if he had if he had just done it if he had just been born let's say 20 years later uh, perhaps the the ecosystem would have been better but this is often the case for a lot of let's say first level entrepreneurs you know first generation people who take the risk in some cases it can become a wild success in some cases it can fold up and ravi varma is an example of one kind of success but also of disappointment uh, commercially speaking on the five states that you mentioned um this is where the historical side comes in which is that when we think of the rajas when we think of these traditional political figures traditional political and cultural leaders we again think that they all come from these typical royal families you know genealogies are unbroken uh, ge- uh, royal bloodlines and so on but you realize upward mobility existed in those days as well you know travanco way he came was a family that really established itself the royal family established itself only in the 18th century and it it, it really rises up from there and they essentially ended up doing rituals that upgraded them from a lower caste to a higher caste position pudukote where he went and painted the rulers were colors color even today in malayalam and tamil translates as robber or thief they came from a caste mm. and community that the british branded a criminal tribe and yet they had become kings and yet they governed there uh, even forget the states ravi orma went to the ruler of indore came from the shepherd caste you know the raj ruler also shepherd rulers there were shudra rulers rulers who came from all kinds of background and that's kind of interesting to begin with then he goes to a state called baroda in baroda mysore udaipur travanco all of these states heirs were often adopted and these adopted heirs to the throne came sometimes from the most obscure backgrounds there's this, there's this king called sayajira gaikwad the third of baroda great modernizer industrialist uh, in, in in his orientation very very you know popular progressive kind of ruler of the of the early 20th century ruled from 1881 to 1939 till the age of 12 he was an illiterate farm hand working on a farm in near in, in near nasik in maharashtra at that age he was a distant relative of the royal family he was plucked from that farm planted on the throne and then became a king and you see the a similar thing in mysore where the raja who dies in the 1860s doesn't have his legitimate uh, son of his own ends up adopting a boy from another family and he succeeds to power so principally politics tells us also about this kind of mobility for castes mobility for individuals and it breaks some of these stereotypes about these people all being from one kind of background one kind of privileged setting and so on not necessarily it was often much more flexible than we think and just as politics today can be very colorful lots of colorful things happened even in the 19th century in the princely states absolutely um to talk to us about uh... what was the reception of uh, ravi varma among say the british or among say the indian national congress or some of uh, the uh, the places where the reactions were ambiguous or hostile you know the the hostility to his work came after he died almost instantly you know 1906 is when he dies uh, only in his late 50s but you see 1906 1907 1905 if you look at the years in our typical indian textbooks history textbooks you'll see that this is when bengal is being partitioned this is when the congress yeah. party is splitting between two groups the moderates so called and the so called extremists the difference is this the earlier generation of nationalists to which ravi varma belonged they still believed that the british would ultimately do that which was honorable they thought all indians needed to do was 
proof that they were capable of governing themselves and the empire would naturally sort of fade away into history. The extremists, on the other hand, you know, people like uh, Lokmanya Tilak, for example, believe that independence cannot be had by begging, which means you have to agitate and you have to agitate, let's say, in in a very forthright way. This is also the time when revolutionaries are coming up in Bengal, you know, they're bombing people, assassinating British officials. That is the kind of mood that is coming up. This is when Ravi Varma really, you know, uh, soon after his death is forgotten, he's turned into something of a bad figure because they thought that by painting in a Western style with oil paints and so on, he had essentially imitated the British and that was not something that needed to be done. Instead, the truly nationalist patriotic thing to do would be to revive Indian art from previous times. So the Bengal school was about reviving older styles, about bringing back an older style of painting. At that time, because nationalism was very thick in the air, it it felt like everything that was not Swadeshi or or Indian had to be discarded, which involved Mm -hmm. discarding Ravi Varma's work as well. But of course, in his time, while he was alive, things were still different. Think people did not see things in, in black and white, I suppose. They realized that you, you know, independence is a long struggle. You have to make a, a moral case for nationalism first. You have to bring people together, make them feel to begin with. You have to give people in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Kashmir, all these disparate areas feel like they're part of the same nation. People did not think that. Uh, they required, you know, it, it required a great deal of effort to even make them feel that. So Ravi Varma's generations, the kind of hard work they had to do to construct even the argument that later generations have taken for granted was a slightly different uh, ball game altogether. So in his time, uh, he was actually quite popular. Uh, the the British admired him. Uh, there are, of course, bad uh, you know reviews of some of his paintings and so on that mm-hmm. I came across in, in the news newspaper arcs in London, etc. But in general, he was a very successful portrait artist with a lot of English grandees, uh, to the extent that many of them saw him very much as a social equal and as a friend. Uh, you know, his, his work was sometimes used by English Orientalists in their books as, as frontispieces and images. Uh, he painted everybody from the governor of Madras to, you know, the, the son of a British official in the princely state of Mysore. On the nationalist side, it was his uh, lithograph prints of Shivaji that helped Tilak sort of popularize the Shivaji uh, festival or the Shiva Jayanti in Maharashtra. He also did, did portraits of Tilak, and just as the extremist uh, politics was growing, uh, extremist in courts, it was his portraits of Tilak that really became very popular and so on. At the same time, he was on good terms with moderate politicians like Dada Bhai Nauroji, of whom he did a portrait. Of, of, of people like G.K. Gokhale, uh, which is the person he lobbied to help get a copyright law. So in his time, Ravi Varma was actually pretty popular on all sides. He had bridges with the British and good relationships with them, so much so that his work was presented to the Prince of Wales when he visited India in the 1870s. He was on good terms with moderate politicians, and he was on good terms with uh, the so-called extremist politicians or the new generation of, of nationalists as well. Uh, but yeah, when he died, he sadly ended up with a bad reputation for some time. And it took till the 1990s for Indians to realize that perhaps that was unkind and that we should recognize his contribution uh, a little more maturely. And uh, of course, it was late in the day, almost a century after he he had died. But, you know, uh, as of last week, a Ravi Varma painting was auctioned for 20 crore rupees, which is uh, not a small amount, which means that the market still seems to seems to admire him and there's still takers for Ravi Varma and his work. I know that a bunch of crypto people are listening to this or will listen to this discussion as well. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody creates a Ravi Varma NFT, a non-fungible mm-hmm. token, and auctions off uh, on OpenSea. Who knows? But uh, knows? one thing that you do know, <laughs> <laughs> one thing you do argue really well in the book, uh, Manu, is that culture is a complex site. That instead of looking at art as uh, something like, you know, as a victory or a badge of honor, and there is a lot of merit in exploring it in layers. So um, can you talk to us about uh, the complexity of looking at culture and art and uh, perhaps connect it to nationalism or hypernationalism? Well, I'll begin with the art thing. To begin with, you know, we just discussed how people thought Ravi Varma's style was foreign because he was inspired by a foreign style of painting. It, and, and the example I usually give is of this old Deccan painting from the 16th century, 16th century, early 17th century, uh, which is, you know, from, let's say, towards central India. The Deccan is, is, is not all the way north, somewhere between the north and south, the far south. 
Now, what's interesting is this is a this is miniature painting of a lady. You look at it and you think that this is an Islamic princess because she's seated like an Islamic princess. Her clothes are, are very Persianate clothes. But then you look closely and you start realizing that she has a conch, there's a veena, there's a book, and you realize that this is actually a Muslim king's recreation of Saraswati, of the of the Hindu mm-hmm. goddess Saraswati. Now, this is considered a great example of Deccan art, and nobody would call it not legitimate Indian art. It is legitimate Indian art, even though it marries a Persian style with a Hindu subject. So if that is legitimate Indian art, how is it that Ravi Varma painting Shakuntala, Lakshmi, Parvati, all the Indian goddesses and gods in a Western style is not Indian? Because, I mean, the point is art is not something that you can revive and restore. It's not a rock. It's not something that doesn't change. It's always moving with culture. It's always built on multiple influences coming together. And that's what he did as well. He, he did not imitate the British in the sense that he took their style and painted white people and, and painted English meadows and that kind of thing. No, he painted Indian scenes with a Western style. He did something unique, but it's very much part of Indian culture, even though uh, nationalists in the in the 1910s uh, tended to disagree. That's just the art side of it. Cultural complexity. Now, even you know issues on on colonialism, for example, we sometimes reduce it to this black and white kind of issue, which is the colonizer equal to bad, the freedom fighters equal to good, and that's all there is to the story. But you know, there's more complexity to this. To begin with, yes, if you look at white people oppressing brown people, sure, that that certainly happened. But what's happening within Indian society as well? You take a princely state like Rajputana, as I said, the Rajput ruler is dealing with pressure from above, from the British. He's got to deal with his own courtiers, his own chieftains, his own nobles, who had who had their kind of politics to play, and he has to keep them in check as well. But he also has tribal groups in his kingdom who are resisting his power. He also has peasant groups that are resisting his power. In fact, in the princely states, the whole issue of colonialism gets slightly complicated because often when people fought back and pushed back, they were not pushing against a foreign colonizer. They were pushing against other Indians in power who were oppressing them. Which is not to say there's some kind of black and white answer to it. It's just that it's always more complex than we would like to think. That the world, just as today we know that the world is a complex place, uh, things do not happen easily, uh, decisions can't be taken easily. You know, you, you have a, a, an excellent technocratic decision, but there's also cultural sensitivities, there are social pressures, and a, a political leader has to bring all of these things into, into mind before ultimately deciding what course or what policy is decided. The same existed in the past as well. So that kind of complexity is something that I try to to communicate uh, through this book on the princely states. And on hyper-nationalism, yes. I mean, there was a time when nationalism, nationalism, again, a a result of history. It came up in a particular historical context, 18th century, 19th century. It came up due to certain conditions. To turn that into a stick, to turn that into a danda by which you start beating people up, that's a problem. Hypernationalism of any kind is dangerous because it crosses that fine line between patriotism and love for your country, love for your motherland into turning it into a kind of test, into turning it into a kind of new form of othering some while saying that only these people are legitimate members of the community. And it's not just about cultural fears, it's not about cultural identity alone. Hypernationalism does have economic consequences, it does have political repercussions, it does have repercussions on technology, it does have repercussions on education, it does have repercussions on even the idea of truth. You know, it's it's because of hypernationalism sometimes that historians can sometimes become very unpopular these days because we say things that may not be to the liking of some dominant uh, thought or a dominant line of thinking at any given moment. Because our job is to unravel the complexities of the past, but hypernationalism requires easy, recognizable, simple narratives. So my job is to say actually it's complicated, but the hypernationalists will say no, that that's not the answer I want to hear because I want let's say an unbroken uh, genealogy of, of nationalism. I want to say that you know everybody from Ashoka onwards was just this hyper nationalist who was trying to uh, build an Indian nation, etc. There, there's a kind of reading of history which is not necessarily scholarly when you when you bring in something like hyper nationalism. So yeah, it's a it's a complicated time. Uh, as as I keep joking to people these days, it's not a question of if you'll go to jail for something you've written. It is the question of when you'll go to jail for something you've written or something you've said. But that said, again, because I'm a student of history, I remain an optimist in general, because anything that goes up also comes down. Anything that 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 becomes 
too unwieldy that becomes too negative has its it, it ends up shooting itself in the foot it can't be sustained the only problem is it does a lot of damage in the process it causes a lot of pain in the process and that could have been avoided you know the the one lesson history teaches us that is that you know you can always count on human beings and their stupidity we keep making the same errors again we may keep making the same mistakes again and great empires don't necessarily fall because of foreign enemies they often collapse because of internal weaknesses and because of internal turmoil and internal turmoil comes from some of these uh, issues that we are confronting in the world today in the previous answer you talked about uh, dada bhai nauroji can you just walk us through um, through him and through that i think uh, our listeners will be able to understand the broader point that you're trying to make because he was a very interesting figure people read about him in textbooks in a certain light but as your book explains there is more to it uh, that people should know Yeah, Dada Bhai Nauruji was a late 19th century nationalist. Uh, died around a little before 1920, I think, if I'm not wrong. A uh, very old man by then. Gandhi called him a Mahatma. So you can, you know, if Gandhi called him a Mahatma, you can take it for granted that his nationalist <laughs> credentials can't be questioned. Uh, he was called the Grand Old Man of India. He's most famous for two things. One is the Drain Theory, which is a, a sort of polemical uh, book he wrote in which he argues that the British were actually leeching away all of India's resources. Sources and wealth and, and and essentially its prosperity and and devitalizing India in order to enrich itself in its island nation back home. Uh, and the other thing he's famous for is that he was one of the first Indians to win an election to the House of Commons in Britain. So he actually went to Britain and ended up winning an election there, uh, where you know people called him a black man, said that why should a native uh, come here and teach us civilized people to rule and so on. So he had to put up with a lot of racism as well. But you look at his nationalism and how it evolves, and it tells you a lot about that early generation of nationalists, how they understood the complexity of the situation and were not prone to looking for easy solutions or quick answers. They were willing. for an increment increment incrementalist style of 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 working towards freedom because he was born and he was growing up and became a young man at a time when there was the great 1857 rebellion which was an armed rebellion against british rule against the rule of the east india company but remember it did not work it 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 flopped ultimately uh now we have since then turned it into the first war of independence and so on but think of it from nauruji's position he's a young man in bombay at the time he's reading the news he knows this rebellion is taking place mainly in northern india it collapses it does not succeed and the british put it down and and, and people who participated have been punished rather violently naturally his generation of young men much as they love india much as they want india to become a free nation they know that military techniques are perhaps unlikely to succeed because we just tried and it failed which means what you have to come up with a new way of of responding to colonialism a new way of fighting imperialism so this generation picks up the english language through the english language it picks up political words and a vocabulary of democracy that is understandable to westerners that is understandable in britain and uses that to articulate its own message so it says okay fine military means won't work we will now start writing in newspapers we will now start having our own journals we will now start using these political concepts using the language of democracy to essentially build a moral case for indian nationalism and shame the british into treating india better it's a long process you know you're writing all these papers there are people against you there are indians against you you know when the congress party was formed there was actually something called the united india patriotic association that actually was was created to stand up to the congress and side with the british with indians in it prominent indians in it so it was a tough process but dada bhai nauruji does it all the same he's also trying to build a successful business because he's a businessman he comes from the parsi community which is a trading community and the parsi is you know uh, the tatars for example for them and some of their associates princely associates like the maharaja of mysore industrialization and showing that you could claim scientific and techno technological prowess was also a way of fighting british uh, imperialism it was also a way of fighting the cliche that natives did not know how to do science and technology so that was another way of pushing back nauruji eventually moves to london where he sets up something called the East India Association it's an association of not only indians in london who are of course a minority but also a handful of influential white people journalists writers thinkers people who've actually worked in india who are also let's say sympathetic to india and right under the queen's nose they start having lectures they start having events and debates to essentially prove 
that in London, that the British are not doing well by India. So it, it's building a kind of base for India right there in the capital of the British Empire under the nose of Queen Victoria. When he gets an opportunity, Dadabai Nauruji leaves his business and his career in London and actually comes back to India to serve the Maharaja of Baroda as his divan or as his minister. Why? Because Nauruji theorizes that if you take one Indian princely state, you turn it around and make it a success administratively, get its economy in order, help it modernize, the whole argument of the British that natives do not know how to govern themselves collapses. You prove in one princely state that if the natives can govern themselves, there's no need for the British to, to, to hang around in India. You know, they can hand over power to Indians. So he does that for a while. It's not easy. He ultimately ends up going back to London. And that's where he uh, you know, establishes a lobbying house for Indian princes who've been treated badly. And they can take his help to appeal directly to the British government and to the British parliament in London. His East Indian Association uh, resumes and it continues long after he's dead. Uh, he wins the election into the House of Commons. He writes his famous book on the drain theory and then finally returns to India and, and, and retires to Bombay, which is where he eventually dies. If you compare it to a Gandhi who sort of mobilized the masses and so on, it doesn't seem like a very romantic story. But the thing is, hmm. for the romantic story to come, for mass agitation to happen, for nationalism to be taken for granted, people like Nauruji had to first build a base. They had to first build a kind of intellectual foundation. And that has its own value. And that is also important uh, to study. Again, it's the same uh, today. You know, when I think every conversation people have discussing hypernationalism, discussing the perils of hypernationalism, discussing the perils of some of the, 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 the cultural trends we are seeing. You know, every time we have these conversations, it's a form of pushing back. You know, it, it may not achieve something immediately. It doesn't mean all the hypernationalists agree and, and decide to retire from public politics. They don't. Uh, they'll continue to do what they're doing. But it slowly builds a kind of argument against that. And hopefully at some point that argument will get uh, real wings and eventually uh, some kind of uh, rebalancing, some kind of, uh, you know, new arrangement can be, can, be, can be found. And it'll take time. But it's an effort worth having. Every conversation we have about ideas, every conversation we have about politics, every conversation we have about the state of the world contributes to that process. You know, ultimately, change comes from debate. Change comes from having those conversations. And, you know, I, I, and this is precisely why my earlier point on wokeism, where people take maximalist positions, to me is dangerous because you're digging in your heels and you're refusing to have a conversation. You may disagree, but you must at least try to understand where your opponent is coming from. And it's the same with some of the hyper-nationalists. For instance, you know, the, in India, Savarkar is this, is, is this very polarizing figure. But my point is that instead of simply sort of cancelling him, what's important is to understand where he comes from, understand his argument, because even to disprove his argument, you need to first know what the argument is which means you have to read his writing, you have to read his argument, you have to understand what he's saying, and then frame your counter response to that. It's hard work. It doesn't come from simply putting up a tweet on social media saying, I hate Savarkar. That really doesn't work. At least for me, it doesn't work that way. For me, it really means first engaging with, it's a dangerous ideology that I don't like personally, but I will still engage with it and read it and understand it and digest it so that I can frame a detailed, mature and comprehensive response to it. And that's why I say debate is ultimately essential and mature avenues for debate as well. Uh, this is why institutions are also important. You know, it's important to have spaces where this, these kind of conversations can happen so that, you know, ideas can thrive and, and something better can be built uh, in, in, in the future. Yeah. Um, on the Nauruji point, you talked about uh, him presenting an alternate view of good governance. You know, that seems to be a popular phrase these days. So talk to us about other examples about good governance. The one that I particularly like was the math guy who would collect data and send it back to the Britishers. And uh, first tell me, how did you find this math guy? Who is this, this math guy? And what was his answer to the quote unquote uh, good governance model? I think you're referring to a man called Sati Madhara who I alluded to earlier. Yeah. Now that entire generation, you know, they all of these native statesmen as they were called at that time, Many of them often came from the same schools, they came from the same institutions and the same kind of background because English education was extremely important for them. 
and they would join the british service they were all from british india and they very quickly realized that under colonialism there was only so far a brown man could go there was only so far a native could succeed in british service which is why a lot of them given the opportunity would transfer to the princely states where suddenly they became ministers to indian maharajas where they had a lot more power than they could ever wield in british india in british india at most you could be like a, a right hand man to an important englishman but you couldn't be the main figure yourself whereas in a princely state you could be that main figure you could enjoy and wield power at a completely different level and they obviously did feel that there was something to be done with that power it wasn't power for its own sake there was a desire to do something with it so a man like sir t madhav rao goes into a princely state of called travancore its revenues are, are are crashing the treasury is empty the rulers are under pressure from the british there's a threat that the british might even annex the state madhav rao arrives, arrives there uh becomes the minister to the raja and slowly starts bringing in reforms he realizes for example that rulership in the 19th century is also about public service so suddenly a large chunk of state revenues are being allocated to building roads to building bridges to building schools of a modern type because he feels that it's important the state should do this all the same the raja is allowed to maintain his temples to keep his important ceremonies expensive ceremonies happening that's fine but the argument is made that while you do that you must also build roads and you must have a progressive orientation towards government and towards governance uh, he he starts sort of cre- collecting statistics and this is where the math comes in he starts bombarding the british with statistics on how many roads are being built and how many schools are being uh, established simply to sort of keep them at bay because the british often used misgovernment as an excuse to interfere in the princely states whereas by actively demonstrating that the state was well governed you could keep the british influence at a minimum you could show that there's no need for the british to come and poke their nose here because we are doing a fine job thank you very much so that was the strategic side of what a man like sir t uh, madhav rao was trying to do and ultimately what if you look at a state like travancore he serves a king called ailam tirunal and then he's also tutored ailam tirunal's brother and successor and together these two rajas rule for 25 years their successor rules for nearly 40 years but he's a much more lackluster ruler he's not a particularly original ruler not particularly energetic rather orthodox man but because of the institutions the framework and the kind of things madhav rao had set up with the two earlier maharajas the state even on autopilot continued to be a revenue successful state it had it had revenue uh, it didn't have a deficit it actually had it made profits every year it managed to invest it it managed to maintain the roads it managed to add to the schools so even with a bad ruler even with a lackluster ruler the state did fine because institutions had been built and because an earlier generation had invested in building those institutions and actively gone out and done it and madhav rao then after his service of, of about 14 years in travancore he hops off and goes to a princely state called indore and helps the raja there then he comes to a gujarati state called baroda helps the ruler there he even his son ends up going and becoming diwan in mysore his classmate ends up in pudukote you know that one generation of men they sort of hopping from princely state to princely state revitalizing these places setting up institutions of good governance precisely so that uh, these states could stand on their legs and the british would not be able to come in and swallow them up and that's i suppose the lesson there is precisely this sometimes you need people committed to building institutions because genius indiv- individuals ultimately die institutions take longer to wilt away and therefore there's you can keep that alive you can keep the system working and you can build something that doesn't necessarily depend on one human being or one lifetime but can perhaps survive a century or two fascinating i have just two last questions and then i'm going to open it up uh, for 5 minutes um, for the, for the audience one is connect the dots the last sentence of your book and tricycles and i'll just leave it at that <laughs> no you know the the i forget the last sentence my book the tricycle at the beginning let me read it out too sure. let me read it out to you actually tell the tricycle story and then you can connect it as i read the, the tricycle the, the first image in the book it's in black and white sadly because it's not in the colored part of the book but it's about a young man a, a prince of 16 years posing on a tricycle and when i say tricycle i don't mean the tricycle children use but the the adult tricycle of the late 19th century which even queen victoria had the 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 the, the, the ruler of egypt had one for example all of these people that tricycle was very posh modern thing to have it was like this cool gadget like today we have the latest iphone and things like that this was the the cool thing in the late in the in the 1880s to own 
And here you have an, an Indian prince, aged 16, uh, from a very orthodox princely state, Travancore, posing on a tricycle in Western clothes. And he's just finished his matriculation exam. He, in fact, goes on to become the first Indian prince to go to university and get a BA degree. And he was therefore called the BA prince. Uh, and he's posing on the tricycle and he's got Ravi Varma to paint him like this because he's making a point. He's saying that this tricycle, this gadget is something that appeals to the, the ruler of Egypt, Queen Victoria, people in America, everybody who's, uh, who's, who's anybody in the cosmopolitan global universe has a tricycle. And I am claiming to be a part of that club. I am claiming to be a member of that, that modern sort of cool set, that very sort of outward looking cosmopolitan set by posing on this. Similarly, his clothes, the way he's looking at the viewer, it's all about making a statement about his own modernity and arguing back against the idea that just because he's an Indian prince in an Indian princely state, he's somehow backward. He's saying, actually, no, I'm, I'm just like you. I'm part of this global set rather than just some provincial type who doesn't know that the world has changed and is just lost in some archaic universe. That's not the case. That's why I, I begin the book with that painting as an illustration of how art can be used to communicate political messages and also about how princes were very conscious of about flaunting their modernity and showing that they were not just uh, relics from the past, but had contemporary political substance and contemporary something to offer the, the modern world as well. Yeah. So the last sentence, just before the epilogue, not the last sentence of the epilogue, uh, it was almost a metaphor uh, for princely India itself, a splash of outward glory before fading into the proverbial twilight of history. If you could just comment on this sentence, perhaps connected to the tricycle, if you can. Well, it, that sentence comes from the, the last chapter of the book, which is about the Rajput state of Udaipur and how its ruler is deposed. And, you know, he is allowed finally only to go for his royal hunts and go for his little boat rides and things like that. And it's interesting because this ruler was not toppled by the British. You know, unlike the prince I just described on the tricycle, who was very keen to sort of claim membership in the modern world. This man uh, in Udaipur was something of a conservative. He thought, why should I claim? Why should I even play by the terms the colonizer sets? Why should I study the English language? Why should I build modern institutions? I'm going to stick to my traditional institutions. But the problem with that also is that when you try to stick to something consciously holding on to something you think is traditional, as several hypernationalists now do, where you think this is the only way. I'm sorry, the world moves forward. You know, you can't prevent technology. You can't prevent uh, the rest of the change that's happening in the world. And you can't just pretend to be an island in the midst of all that change. But the result was that although he managed to hold the British at bay for about 30 odd years, ultimately his own people rebelled against him and he was toppled from power. And at a time when there was a lot of change, nationalism was coming in, people's movements were building up, uh, royal power was being questioned. He was not only toppled, he then, as I said, had to sort of, you know, content himself with royal shikars and hunts and these, these boating expeditions. And that final line is a reference to that, where there's this journalist or this visitor who observes him He's no longer the active ruler and he comes down in his old fashioned clothes and he gets onto this boat and there are dancing girls and all of that. And the boat is sort of, it sort of goes off with its dancing girls and with all that royal paraphernalia. And that's precisely the problem, which is that this was a man who refused to change. So very much he, he, he sort of stayed back in some kind of earlier period and it looked like it was exotic. It looked very pretty. There were the dancing girls and so on, but he had to drift away. He was no longer in power. He lost power and he lost political meaning simply because he clung a bit too much to his own idea of what was traditional instead of trying to mold tradition and make sure that it could survive in the modern age. So that's why I end the book uh, with that particular sentence. Yeah. And I'm going to end my questions with this last question, which is, uh, do you think history is the study of the past or is it the study of change based on this book and the other stuff that you've written? I can't help but think that at least in the way I look at things somehow, history is often a study of human character because you see ultimately 
who are the people making history you know we can study history through economic trends through social events cultural movements etc but the core of it is what human beings it is people it is people negotiating climate change it is people negotiating geographies it is people negotiating forests it is people negotiating changing uh, events it is people negotiating violence but ultimately what is it it is about people it is about human beings and for me that is the thing i am most fascinated about what history can tell us about human character and sadly for every wonderful thing you find about human character often as i said earlier what you find more often is stupidity uh, which is why although i'm optimistic about the world i can't help but believe that ultimately everything has an expiry date because human beings shoot themselves in the in in the foot and uh, but but that's how i look at history as a study of human character as a study of human beings as human beings build societies human beings also end up uh, breaking societies well manu i can't help but uh, remark that uh, your book although traces the past studies character it's so contemporary everything that we've talked about today and the many many things that you've talked about in the book are uh, are just they make so much sense even in the 21st century as we talk about uh, you know nationalism changing color technology changing form i couldn't help but connect picasso and raja ravi varma in their uh, evangelistic uh, strategies so to speak so congratulations on writing a, a remarkable book i hope uh, Thank you. Uh, people in india and around get to read it i actually wasn't aware that you have uh, different publishers because i had sage for my book uh, that came out last year and they sort of uh, made sure it was available everywhere so yeah i i'm uh, not very is... i'm a bit i'm a bit promiscuous when it comes to publishers partly because i've entirely done it based on my friends you know my first editor was at harper collins okay. then she moved to a new company which is yeah. owned by amazon and then she said oh you must give me a book so my third book was published with her my second book and the fourth book are published with a uh, with jagannath which is also uh, I, my editor is also a friend of mine so i i'm, I'm very promiscuous that way uh, with my publishers <laughs> well the book has done really well and everyone should absolutely read it we're going to put yes, uh, the link of uh, the book in the show notes and uh, yeah congratulations one more time Thank um you. there's there are, there's one minute left if anyone has a burning question uh, or a comment maybe question then you can put it in the chat or maybe just unmute yourself and we will let you in i see a question in the chat where it says would you start a podcast <laughs> no i don't plan to i keep getting asked whether i'll start a podcast i have appeared on several podcasts including the network capital uh, podcast but as of now i have no plans to start my own podcast one of the temptations in today's world is if you're half decent at something people expect that you know you must immediately go put your finger in it whereas my philosophy is very old fashioned which is that i'm good at writing i want to focus on writing and history for now uh, you know just because i seem to enjoy doing podcasts doesn't mean right now i need to immediately go and do it maybe in the future maybe when uh, you know i've i've written my next uh, or finished my next few projects and i have a, a space and a breather maybe then i'll do a podcast but you know for now i don't have a plan sorry to disappoint you yeah but varsha uh, one thing you should look at is uh, manu's previous podcast with us where he talks about how he thinks of his time how he manages his schedule and i think uh, you'll get a sense of how manu works through that we're going to send you all an email with the link uh, it's also available on networkcapital.tv but i personally found it fascinating and i'm pretty sure you will as well ha uh, my first book you pick maharani say to lakshmi bhai now raja ravi or maybai well uh, different reasons the first book with the protagonist uh, say to lakshmi bhai was a female historical figure and i'm somebody who's generally lamented that much of our, our idea of indian history is just shaped by men whereas you know the question we must ask is where are the women in indian history and focusing on seetu lakshmi bai was my way of of trying to bring back uh, an important and marginalized female political actor into the limelight and talk about and talk about politics and talk about history through uh, that female protagonist and i think it's important to do that to to speak more about the role women played in public life and they did play a role in public life it's often the case that we are just not we were not culturally taught to look at them or identify that role but in reality they have played an important role and increasingly more and more people are talking about the contributions women have made on why ravi varma for this book as we discussed earlier precisely because he was an artist uh, he, he worked in multiple princely states and because of that i could just follow him around and he would choose the princely states for me instead of me arbitrarily choosing some state to fit my argument as opposed to 
following him so that i would yeah. land up in unexpected places and what i found would shape my argument rather than me picking states to suit my argument that was the the hope at least it certainly came through those five states the, the tool i found it uh, fascinating there's so much more that we haven't discussed today uh, which uh, i'm pretty sure as the readers listen to this or watch it they'll uh, feel tempted to have a wonderful evening manu and i look forward Thank to you. meeting you in delhi london some part of the world soon enough see you soon yeah, take care thanks man.